Good morning. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin Dana, and I am the Executive Director of Merchandising and Product Development for Accord Events. And uh, I'm uh, excited to be here this morning to talk about uh, changing uh, trends, guidelines, and the changes uh, in the event and exhibit industry uh, as a result of COVID-19. And also just to talk about some general trends overall for design as well. Uh, before I start, I want to thank uh, Classic Exhibits for the opportunity and for allowing us to get together and share ideas and uh, stay in touch uh, until events and exhibits start up again. Um, today, a lot, I'm going to talk about a lot of things, but obviously everything I'm speaking about is based on what we know today. And this is a very... Uh, uh, the environment is changing constantly. There's new guidelines uh, coming out from the CDC, and uh, things are different in different areas of the country. But uh, based on what we know today, uh, I'm going to talk about some general guidelines and uh, some points for safety, and then talk about some design. So I'm going to dive right in. Uh, just some general guidelines, things that we're seeing right now. Uh, in the industry, uh, we believe that when meetings and exhibits come back, uh, typically they're going to be for 50 people or less, uh, possibly up to 100 people where jurisdictions uh, allow that. Uh, but venues will be severely limited uh, to uh, 40 to 50 percent capacity or less. And there will be a lot of new considerations for events and how uh, uh, to make them safer and to give our attendees and clients uh, peace of mind. Everything from, you know, possible thermal scanning and temperature checks uh, to wearing masks, uh, lots of hand sanitizer and washing uh, areas prominent with signage. I really like the idea of individually wrapped disinfectant wipes placed, especially near food stations and on furnishings. It, uh, certainly enhanced sanitation procedures uh, uh, will be in effect. Uh, at court, you know, we have implemented uh, a broad range of sanitation procedures and checklists uh, to make sure that, you know, furnishings are cleaned and certified ready uh, before delivery. So, and that's going to be really important. And, and you know, indications or signage or, you know, certifications that, you uh, furniture and fixtures have been disinfected. And some of that, a lot of it will fall onto the venue, but uh, it's going to be extremely important as events and meetings open up. Uh, there's going to be a need for extra staffing to san sanitize and disinfect uh, surfaces and furnishings after use. And I'm going to talk some more about that as we get into this. Uh, lots of new considerations or updated considerations with regard to insurance uh, for that increased level of risk. Uh, triage plans uh, in case an individual does start showing symptoms during an event or a meeting or a conference. Uh, lots of more signage, everything from Florida cows to signage reminding employees about social distancing and attendees as well. And then I do believe where possible there will be a shift to outdoor spaces. Uh, that's not going to be uh, an option in every locale, but uh, wherever possible, I do think that, uh, you know, planners will, will uh, employ outdoor spaces to give a little more room and allow for distancing. Uh, some considerations for meetings and events. Uh, definitely a term I, 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 I term local, uh, which is a global and a local format. So, you know, having smaller local or regionalized gatherings, but uh, including a broadcast or a live stream for remote attendees. Uh, so that way, you know, they can feel like they're a part of it, uh, but not actually have to travel to be there. You know, there will be a lot more regional gatherings and fewer of the larger gatherings, at least in the beginning. Uh, you know, and these are events are all, uh, certainly there to inform, but also to entertain and to uh, keep those uh, remote attendees more engaged. Uh, you know, the suggestion is to, you know, create more of an anchor desk in a TV show set rather than uh, a classroom, and certainly recording for distribution po post event so you can amplify the message of these uh, global events. Technology plays a big part as well. Uh, at a, a local event or a regional event, uh, it 
it has, but it will be increasingly important to have more monitors and larger monitors around a room to prevent clustering or gathering. Mobile phones are going to play an increasingly important part of these uh, events as we come back uh, to keep the attendees engaged in integrating uh, more live chat features for comments, questions, and polls. Uh, certainly no communal microphones. Anyone on stage would be uh, fobbed and would not be sharing microphones. And music at uh, the events and, and uh, meetings that we will be at will certainly need to be lower so attendees can hear each other. Uh, stages. So uh, stages certainly uh, will need to be more socially distant. Uh, you know, the, the presenters on stage, their seating is going to be uh, further apart, six feet. Uh, definitely creating a greater sense of warmth and comfort uh, using drape, using uplighting, uh, and allowing for you know remote questions to be answered immediately via chat and, and checking in with the audience more often uh, as you'll have fewer attendees on the floor. It's going to be very important to check in with those remote attendees as well. Uh, and then certainly if there's any uh, entertainment, uh, you know the trend over the past few years has has been to bring entertainment, you know, down onto a floor of an event or a meeting. Uh, now it will uh, most certainly have to be distance on the stage. Any any entertainment that has been uh, 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 used in, in these types of events. So, um, how do we design socially distanced meetings and events? And you know, some of this is very intuitive. Uh, you know, with the six, uh, seating placed six feet apart, uh, there will be a greater use. Of you know individual chairs, but if you do use a sofa or a love seat, they will be uh, at least in the beginning a space for one person. Uh, classrooms are going to be uh, designed using a six foot wide table, or if you have a smaller table, it'll need to be six uh, feet apart from uh, any other attendees. Uh, for big conferences, uh, it looks like there probably won't be breakout rooms least in the beginning. Uh, you, you will have an owned space rather than a communal space. So the chair that you get at the beginning of a meeting or a conference will be the place that you stay. Um, and for social events or other uh, parts of the meeting where uh, there is movement, uh, I can see red or green indicator cards on seating to signal whether it has been sanitized between usage. So if an attendee knows that or sees that there's a green card on a chair, that would indicate that it has been sanitized. Uh, charging and power is still going to be very important, of course, and more, but it will need to be more individualized. So you know you can achieve that with uh, seating that has power incorporated into it, or with a uh, charging hub that would need to be individually placed by each chair. Uh, so designing social events, I wanted to talk just a little bit about how to think about this. Uh, when you're planning an event, it's a great idea to use a six-foot grid as you're doing your space plan to make sure that uh, attendees have room to circulate and to maintain that social distancing uh, parameter. Uh, concept I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit more and that I think is a really great way to think about this is the 36-inch aura of space that each attendee would have. So as you're moving about a room, as you think about designing a room and, and attendees are moving around, uh, think about them as having that halo, that circle, that aura of space around them that's uh, 36 inches. Uh, and then you want to think about at least 500 square feet for every 10 attendees. Now, this one is uh, actually even space greater than that, this room, uh, about 9,700 square feet, so you could possibly get more people into this room, but it's meant for 50 attendees and 10 to 12 um, uh, staff that's working bars and uh, cleaning, and I'm going to go through that. Uh, micro weddings and micro events, that those are the terms that we're hearing for these uh, events that are 50 people or less. Uh, there's a lot of great ways to keep social distancing or to, to to plan for social distancing and help attendees do that. Uh, using large sectionals, as you see on the bottom right, uh, this is our endless seating, uh, you know, uh, having tables that are placed, seat tables over the furniture, uh, you know, provides a visual cue to attendees that, yeah, you can't sit there. And, and it's going to be top of mind with 
signage, but you know anything you can do to provide a visual, visual cue or a physical cue about social distancing is going to be uh, very important. Social distance seating. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get creative about this. Uh, you know, using individual seating that is uh, a little bit higher. If you look at our endless seating, you see there that has uh, uh, more of a banquette feel. And, you know, rather than using it as a sectional, just pulling it apart a little bit. Individual side tables, I think, are really important for social events. Uh, you know, we, we've gotten so used to, you know, uh, cocktail tables and shared spaces. But, you know, now each seat really does need to have a side table or an end table that uh, is used in use for just one person. Uh, using greenery, hedges, drapery, uh, all of these things help to divide space, provide warm, uh, sense of well-being and comfort. I think those are going to become even more important uh, in this new world of, uh, uh, of events that we're going to see, these uh, smaller events. I want to talk a little bit about bars, registration counters, and food stations because uh, it's going to present some particular challenges. Uh, we believe that uh, bars now, you really are going to need individual bar stations. And, you know, we have some illustrations about, you know, how that might uh, be designed and what it would look like. Uh, certainly, you know, all attendees uh, would probably be gloved and masked, uh, but the bartenders and staff would certainly be. And uh, setting them up behind a plexiglass shield with an opening for serving would provide uh, even greater sense of safety and comfort. Uh, the socially distanced markers on the floor, I believe, are going to be very important to, to really give that visual cue of where attendees can stand and walk, uh, the use of stanchions and signage to reinforce those parameters, and hand sanitizing stations uh, near the food, near the trash cans, uh, you know, just so it, uh, it becomes almost a reflexive uh, uh, motion to sanitize your hands uh, at regular intervals. Uh, here's some examples of uh, what a socially distanced food station or registration counter could be, because I think this design uh, works for both. Uh, no buffets. Uh, we think food will be plated only, and or it could be boxed, pre-boxed, and uh, served by an attendee, uh, or, excuse me, by a server behind the plexiglass directly to an attendee. And then, as you see, the attendee would, uh, you know, be directed where to walk uh, uh, to avoid the line as uh, other attendees are waiting. Uh, you know, you'll want to make sure you're providing enough stations to keep those lines short. Uh, but it would be a, an, a, an event with fewer than 50 people, so, uh, you know, I could foresee, you know, three or four food stations. Uh, no finger food. Uh, you know, we want to use single-use disposal and disposable cutlery plates and napkins and cups if possible, and encourage waste disposal with adequate trash cans and signage. Uh, and, you know, there's some conflicting, you know, opinions about whether you would want bus staff or not. I put no bus staff here because we would want to encourage attendees to dispose of their own uh, food and, and beverage items, but we certainly would want a staff available on hand that is there to help sanitize and clean surfaces, especially after somebody has been seated and eating. Uh, so what about social distance dining? Uh, there's two ways that we are thinking about this and designing this. Uh, certainly the design needs to be 10 to 12 feet apart between tables and chairs. Uh, try to design with one-way traffic flow in mind, reinforced with the signage. Uh, if you want to do dining for two, you can use a six foot table and place one dining chair or one bar stool at the end of a, a long bar table. So you can still have some conversation between that six foot uh, space or the dinner for one concept, which I think is really uh, a more communal way to think about this. Uh, you know, scattering 30 inch round or 36 inch round tables uh, with a single chair or bar stool at each table uh, with the clearly marked spacing. But as you can see there on the right at the bottom, even though you're having dinner for one, you still would be 
uh, within a proximity where you could have a conversation with others also having dinner for one. So I think this is a concept uh, that's uh, unique and still does allow for distancing, but uh, a little bit of uh, networking and communal uh, 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 conversation. So here's uh, a good rendering that you know shows uh, how these uh, events would look like possibly with the social distancing design. Uh, you can see the lower density and lots of open spaces. You know, uh, a lot of the things we talked about with the drape, uh, with the vision. Um, I wanted to talk about reconfiguring by changing geometry. So, you know, we've been conditioned in our design to uh, design seating areas where people are really face to face or sitting right next to each other. And we just need to re rethink that entire concept for now and by changing the geometry. So more angles, obviously further apart, uh, but not so you're face to face. And then uh, the other thing is adding plexiglass screens or other barriers uh, between seats. So, you know, a product like our endless seating you could put a, uh, a, a plexiglass screen in between every seat or every two seats. So somebody could sit, sit there uh, close, closer to each other, but have a, a barrier so they wouldn't be passing germs and they would give them a, a greater sense of safety. So moving over to exhibits and trade shows. And I'm gonna talk about first large um, size booths and then, uh, you know, smaller spaces, which uh, obviously create a little bit more uh, of a challenge to keep people socially distant. Uh, we want to facilitate movement, um, and I believe shows you're going to see show organizers uh, uh, employ much wider trade show aisles that would allow, you know, attendees uh, to, you know, have that social distance and possibly even one way aisles that we're starting to see in grocery stores already. Uh, but I do believe there will be a limit on attendees on a show floor at a trade show. Uh, they're going to extend the hours and, and, and really employ possibly timed entrances, and you're going to see more appointments. So, you know, when people are on the show floor, you know, they will be there for a specific purpose, you know, a, a, to see a specific uh, uh, exhibitor or a vendor. And, you know, there won't, I, I, I hesitate to say, but there'll probably be less milling about, but more, you know, directed uh, appointments and, and people, you know, there for a purpose. Uh, designing events with that one-way traffic flow, more open spaces, designated entry and exit points. I think that's going to be key in any booth space that you create. And, you know, as you can see here, uh, there's uh, some floor decals. I'm not showing signage, but certainly there could be signs as well that designated that. Uh, and using stanchions, uh, there's not a stanchion in this design, but you know, if if you have an appointment in the booth, using a stanchion at the entrance and exit, you know, would just give that visual cue uh, to other attendees not to just wander in. You know, certainly we want to eliminate any roadblock uh, to flow. And again, incorporating dividers and greenery and planters, you know, help to warm it up and create that sense of well-being and uh, safety. Uh, a little bit about conference tables because, you know, that has been a mainstay of exhibits, uh, you know, to allow people to engage and to uh, uh, do business. But uh, we're going to have to eliminate those small conference tables for a while and, you know, it's going to be replaced by using tables that are six feet uh, long, like you can see in this plan, with one person at either end. So similar to that dining experience, you know, a long table uh, with that space in between. So you can still have engagement and you can still talk to people, but once again, it's going to be further apart with more open space and fewer people in that exhibit. Uh, just some real quick designs on uh, this is a 10 by 20. Once again, you know, an entrance and an exit, uh, furnishings placed, you know, uh, far apart with a, a presenter stand in the middle. So you could have one person on either end of the booth and one presenter uh, in the middle for a demonstration. 
And the 10 by 10 is uh, particularly challenging. This is a corner uh, uh, booth, uh, but you know you can still employ that six foot table with a chair or a bar stool on either end, or uh, a chair with an individual side table that's placed further apart, at least six feet, uh, with a designated entry and exit. Uh, we're not really showing the entry and exit on this, but I think that that's the way that uh, you know, 10 by 10 booths are going to need to be designed. And, you know, two, maybe three people in a 10 by 10 booth uh, would be uh, all you could get. So uh, it, it's a little bit more challenging in these spaces. And, you know, I, I imagine we'll probably see a trend towards more 10 by 20 booths and fewer 10 by 10s. So we talked about designing uh, trade shows, events, exhibits. But now I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, some major trends, and this plays into a lot more of what uh, I do for courts, uh, which is assess assessing major trends and then bringing them to our industry uh, and, uh, you know, really assessing what from those major trends is going to be important for us. Uh, when we go to these markets, we go to markets uh, in Cologne in Germany, or Maison of Jay in France, or Neocon in Chicago, and High Point in North Carolina uh, in the U.S. So, uh, you know, we're, we're gauging trends in Europe and trends in the U.S., trying to figure out what uh, translates from a European market to the U.S., recognizing what we don't see, and really helping it uh, using these markets to be a guidepost for our future product development. So I'm going to talk about a little bit what we have seen in the last year because I think even though uh, we have this uh, uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic happening, we are going to meet again, and we are going to, you know, uh, want to be on the forefront of trends. And I think these trends that we have seen will uh, continue to be important. Uh, and the one thing I wanted to mention there, you know, some things that we see in Europe. Don't necessarily translate, you know, that 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 pink uh, velvet sofa with uh, a lot of the floral and the, the teacups, you know, not necessarily something that would translate. So, uh, you know, th those are the things that we're looking for when we go to these markets. Uh, there's really three major trends that I wanted to talk about uh, in design, in furnishing that, that translate over, I believe, for our market. Uh, something where they call Mediterranean craft. Uh, this is something we've seen in Europe, uh, you know, really more of a maximalist style. And I mean, when I say that, you know, it's a sensibility of excess, lots of layering and that textural overload, uh, lots of accessories, taking risks. You can be a little more creative. Uh, you know, this works definitely more for social events. And the, in the U.S., we translated that in a different way to more of a bohemian, chic, urban, rustic look that I'm going to show here in a minute. Uh, new Nordic and Danish, a little more refined, sedate. Uh, it's a more simplistic style, but uh, they're also using fabric and details such as channel stitching and velvet to complement these simpler designs and pairing it with natural wood. And then a little bit more of a glamorous look, the Art Deco retro modern look, which uh, uh, is reminiscent of the early, early 20th century. Um, a lot more shine and sheen, certainly the velvet. This is a very curvy, romantic look. Uh, so all three of these are kind of happening all at once right now, which gives you some variety in some of these major trends. Uh, so there's some uh, more examples of Mediterranean crafts. You know, you see a lot of patterns. They're fringing and knotting and prints. And, you know, it's really that relaxed style that you would see on the Mediterranean shores. Uh, lots of organic colors and ma natural materials. And I think a lot of things that are going to translate for the U.S. market are grasses and greenery, soft finishes, and more soft shapes. So you may not get a look that is as relaxed and as eclectic as what you're seeing here, but you want to think about the elements and of design that they're using here and how you can incorporate you know, some of those into your exhibits. And, you know, certainly over the last couple of years at the exhibitor show, you know, we've seen that urban rustic trend, uh, which a few years ago you would have never thought would have been important in exhibits. Uh, but, you know, 
it, it does provide an avenue for more creativity, more of an individualized exhibit. So I, I do think you're going to see some elements of this come over into the U.S. market. And you know, here's a good example of some vignettes at Neocon in Chicago last year that shows that same concept. You know, take you know, more adapted for the U.S. market, which you know, more bohemian chic, urban rustic. So it's a little bit of a cleaner look, but still very eclectic. Lots of accessories, lots of pattern and texture, and those organic colors. New Nordic, Danish modern. So definitely cleaner here. Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, you know, they're taking those iconic shapes and, and simple forms and putting more textured fabric, adding more stitching and detail. Uh, so it's still simple and has a lot of functionality, but, you know, it's updated and a little more modern with these fabrics. You can take some chances with some colors, uh, a lot of luxurious upholstery, uh, and velvet as well. Velvet, uh, I don't have a specific slide for velvet, but velvet runs through all of these trends. And as we've seen in, you know, any furniture store you had been into before the pandemic, uh, you would see that uh, velvet is the prominent textile on most furnishings right now. And I believe that is going to continue for at least the next few years. Uh, and driving that trend uh, really, you know, because velvet was traditionally seen on Art Deco, uh, is this trend of Art Deco, lots of soft curves and rounded shapes, uh, textured fabrics, a real lush look. Uh, you know, using geometric patterns and shapes uh, to create a drama, um, lots of marble. The marble plays into this as well. Um, and then some colors that uh, can be organic, but also that are a little more startling, a little more rich, like those greens, like those reds. And kind of an extension of Art Deco is this retro modernism. So, you know, it takes it and it's actually a little more playful, uh, really juxtaposing those uh, uh, romantic elements with masculine elements, such as black me metal and marble uh, and granite, to really give uh, <clears throat> a lot of surprise, and it feels very fresh. So the color story. Um, I love color, and, you know, we know <laughs> at court, uh, we've introduced a lot of color over the last, uh, year or two uh, within our chairs and our accessories and, and even in our uh, larger soft seating, but we still uh, rent the black and white the most. So, but, you know, color is going to continue to be more important. And, you know, we do see uh, planners, designers, exhibit companies taking more chances with color. So uh, along those lines, one of the things that we, that I saw in the market over the past year is this using the same color across a spectrum. So varying shades of the same color, whether it's blue, green, pink, yellow, um, <clears throat> different shades of that color all used together. And I think that makes a really great impact because it's not something that we've seen. We're used to seeing um, contrasting colors, but not colors along the same spectrum. So that's something to think about when you're thinking about design on really you know, presenting something that's a little more startling and fresh. Uh, so the, the hues that I'm going to review here, lots of organic hues that are, you know, calming, but also, you know, metallics, they represent our relationship with technology, AI, and fantasy. So, you know, as, as I attend these color conferences, you know, they talk about these soft organic shapes that calm and are welcoming and warm, but, you know, the metallics and metal looking colors and the gold, you know, the silvers, the bronzes, those are important as well, and that really does provide that juxtaposition and, and really represent our relationship with technology. So this is a good representation of the palette uh, that we're seeing right now. Uh, everything from those blues to the spice orange, the yellows, uh, the greens, still some grays, and some emerging browns as well. Here's an example of some of the hues. Um, over the past year at Cologne and at Maison Objet and even High Point, uh, we're seeing greens emerge as that new next hot color. Uh, right now, blues are still uh, the most prominent color, I think, in design for the U.S., 
but greens are definitely going to continue to make uh, a, you know a strengthening play in design. Uh, what which blues you ask? Well, I think every shade of blue right now is uh, important. You know, from the royals, the indigos, the navies, and even the blue grays that are a little more muted that have a little more of the uh, the black undertone. Uh, we're seeing a lot more black in furniture frames and on surfaces, and that's going to continue. And blue really works very well with those black tones, especially these blues with the black undertones. And the greens as well. A lot of the greens that we saw at the market had a black undertone that plays very well with these types of frames. Gray. So gray was the, uh, the new white, the new black, as it were, for the last uh, five or six years. And gray, I think of gray right now as just a staple. It, it fits alongside black and white as a neutral uh, 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 color shade that works with pretty much anything. And we're still seeing it in the market uh, and in the trends, but it is waning. You're seeing just a little bit less of it, a little more blue and a lot more green but the grays are still there. A lot of textured oatmeal hues, and you know these light hues are great because they pair easily with other colors. And you know they're a little softer than like a bright white, uh, even though we know in our industry, bright white is a clean palette. Uh, but this is just a little more warm, um, has a little more texture, and it does go with a lot of those light organic colors. The golden okra, the yellows, the yellow green, this is a great um, accent color that I think you're going to see more and more in the U.S. Certainly in Europe, they use it a lot more than, than we do, but there's various shades of yellow, and you know, yellow has been bubbling uh, around the design and design trends for a while, but it's going to continue to be an accent color, and it pairs obviously great with green, great with blue, great with uh, gray. Oranges, oranges uh, and the spice tones. In Europe, this has been a trend for a while. Starting to see a little more in the US, uh, a little more muted uh, colors with that, you know, more of the dark uh, undertones. I think that, you know, you're gonna continue to see that in the US as well. And the reds. Reds were kind of out for a while, but the berry tones, those uh, strong reds, you know, especially paired with, you know, the pinks and the mauves look really fresh together or using, like I said uh, earlier, uh, various shades of red together to create something that looks very uh, fresh and including some of those oranges with the reds. Brown uh, continues to strengthen. I don't see it as being a prominent color uh, anytime in the near future, uh, Not certainly not as much as green, but uh, you know there are different shades of brown and taupe and they pair very well with the grays and the greens. Black. So, you know, black, we're seeing not only a resurgence of it in frames and in surfaces, but also, you know, in textiles, in the vinyls and in the velvets. And, and uh, so, you know, I think that trend is going to continue. You know, it's great for us uh, at court and on the, uh, it, on the events industry because, you know, black hides everything, right? So, uh, you know, we, we certainly like this trend, but it also, black is a very elegant color, especially when paired with those metallics. And when you do it in a lush fabric, uh, you know, it really has, there's a richness to black. Um, you know, you, and it also can be a very masculine color, but, you know, when paired with the mauves, as you see on that sofa, you know, you can you really juxtapose the masculine and the feminine. Design attributes, marble, we've all seen marble. It's been going on for a while. I put this slide in there to reinforce that marble is gonna to continue to be uh, a design attribute on tabletops that's going to be important for a while. Um, and the important thing about marble is it was a subtle marble in the beginning, but now you're starting to see those, those really dramatic marble tones uh, contrasting, and you know that that and you're going to see more colors in the marble, not just the grays and the blacks and the whites, but a lot more browns and greens in marble as well. So you know, marble in design is something that. Uh, I don't see uh, waning uh, anytime in the near future. Small side tables. This was small side tables were trending before the global pandemic and before we had to think about social distancing, but now they are even more important. 
because when we think about seating, we want to make sure that each person has their own designated table. And, you know, it can be a side table or it can be an end table. And, of course, they come in all shapes and sizes. And, you know, court offers a large variety of side tables and end tables as well. But, um, you know, those are going to be very, very important as we think about designing for social distancing. So how have we translated some of these trends? Um, this is a great uh, uh, image that we did last summer, actually, when we designed this, but we weren't thinking about social distancing. So um, even though there are elements of social distancing uh, in play here, but I think you know we need to think about, okay, here's how we would have designed this last year. How would we design something now? Uh, you know, sectionals are a great way to create large seating, with individual seeds to really provide distance. Um, and I think about, I want to, every time I say distance, I want to say networking as well, because even though we are providing distance and a sense of calm and safety, we still want to promote networking. So, you know, this is a particular challenge for our industry. But I think when you think about, you know, large sectional, individual chairs and seats spaced. Uh, uh, you know, at least six feet away from each other, we can still promote, you know, networking and connection and collaboration, but doing it safely. Just thinking about it a little bit different, differently. So, you know, while we want to save distance, we also want to always still be thinking about connection and networking. Uh, chairs. I mentioned it earlier, um, and, and Court uh, has, like I said, introduced quite a few chairs in a myriad of colors based on some of those trends uh, that we just talked about. But, you know, chairs, I think, you know, certainly allow us to provide social distance uh, and still to, you know, get to do some different configurations that, you know, have some interesting geometry and uh, still provide places for networking and connection. Um, Ottomans. So for the past few years, we've been talking about Ottomans and how great they were because they were movable and you could create campfire settings and you could move them around to create intimate, you know, conversations with people. And, you know, we're not speaking about that any longer. Uh, but now we're thinking about Ottomans and how they can create a large oasis of seating that could provide distance. Um, but still the ability, again, for networking. So, you know, create a big Ottoman configuration. You know, uh, what I'm not showing here is you could put a C table over certain sections of that Ottoman, of the Ottoman to designate where it's safe to sit at a socially distant, uh, you know, uh, space of six feet apart. Dividers, you know, planter dividers, greenery, decorative dividers, Green, drape, you know, there's many, many different ways to provide, you know, uh, distancing and division of space. You know, I, I love doing it <clears throat> with a, a pot and organic looking, you know, planters. It's just a, a way to once again bring the organic feel to your events, a little bit of greenery, um, and still, uh, you know, provide distancing and division. Uh, so the next few slides just are kind of representation of some of the major trends I just talked about, whether it's mid-century Danish modern, deco, or a bohemian chic. Uh, these are vignettes that were photographed before social distancing, so these don't represent social distancing, but they definitely represent, you know, some of the major trends that I talked about with color, with fabric, uh, with surfaces. Uh, you can see the organic. Um, lots of metals, metallic, velvet, you see the browns, you know, incorporating a lot of those different um, trends together and creating something eclectic and fresh. Um, I, I absolutely love the Chandler collection here um, just because it incorporates mid-century and art deco and, uh, you know, that boho urban chic. So you kind of get all in one design. And I think the more chances you take, the more eclectic the designs are, I think the fresher and more unique it is for, you know, attendees and clients. And, you know, what a difference this look is with this book with Chandler. So, you know, you can take some chances, you know, 
change the look with the rugs and pillows and, and create something that looks totally different with the same sofa. Once again, this is a very eclectic mid-century type look. Um, you know, you're seeing channel stitching and faux fur and textured fabrics, you know, wood, metals, all used together. Tufting, tufting is still out there. Uh, our Constellation sofa uh, was my favorite introduction from this year because, you know, it took that Chesterfield look and really updated it, made it modern, a little more whimsical, um, and it pairs great with everything from these mid-century chairs to, you know, um, uh, Art Deco and Danish modern looks. And once again, you know, the, the, chant, uh, the, the constellation pushed with black and white. So, you know, the absence of color is always dramatic as well. And we know in our industry, you know, people love black and white. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I believe Mel uh, was uh, collecting any questions. If there, if there are any, I'm happy to answer them now. Or uh, you can uh, send me an email after this if there's any questions about designing for social distancing, you know, thoughts about, uh, you know, guidelines, and then uh, any questions on trends. So uh, we have some time. If anybody uh, has any questions, Mel? Yes. Thank you, Kevin. Um, this is Mel White from Classic Exhibits. And first of all, I want to thank you, Kevin, for both an educational and an inspiring presentation. This was great. It was, it was a lot of fun to go through all the information that you gave us. Um, for those of you who still have questions, enter the questions into the question panel and we'll get to those. We've got quite a few there already. So one of the questions has to do with sending the, the deck um, that you just had, sending that to the audience. I know that we are recording it and we'll send the recording to everyone. Are you planning on sending the actual physical deck to the audience as well, Kevin? Um, I wasn't, but our uh, sales team will have a copy of it. So, um, yes, they could obtain the deck from our sales team. And if they don't know who their court representative is, um, I am happy, uh, I think, does everybody have my email? I'm happy to uh, send the name of their court representative to them so they can uh, uh, get the deck directly from their court representative. All right. Um, one of the questions is, do you carry the club chairs with the fold-over tray for rental? With a fold-over tray, uh, we do only with the tech chair is our uh, tablet uh, offering. So that's the chair that I uh, showed earlier uh, when I was showing the Power Hub. It uh, has a tablet uh, built into it. Um, it's a gray vinyl chair. It also has power uh, USB hubs built into it as well. So that is one offering where we do have you know a tablet attached to the chair. Uh, we did introduce, uh, you know, six versions of a C table this year, which when I say C table, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that is the table that goes over the seat of a uh, sofa or a chair. So we do have uh, about eight different uh, C table offerings in our collection right now. So uh, I think that addresses that. But, you know, the only chair that we have with a tablet is the tech chair. All right. Another question. Um, is court going to be developing, uh, uh, I just missed the question, sorry, it just moved up on me, and I lost oh, no. it. Hold it, hold on, <laughs> just, uh, the question's still there, it just moved, because people ask. Is court going to be developing rental plexiglass screens that integrate with your furniture? That is a great question, and it's something I'm involved in, yes, right now. So, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and, you know, we hope to get that developed uh, very soon. Uh, the concepts that we're thinking about is, you know, putting, is adding plexi, freestanding plexi screens that can be uh, designed in between, like, different sections of the endless seating. Uh, or they could be freestanding. Uh, and we're also thinking about, you know, counter-mounted uh, plexiglass as well, like I spoke about earlier, where drinks or food could be served underneath it, um, and these would sit directly on top of our bars and our registration counters as well. So a couple of different ways we're thinking about it, you know, to divide seating, whether between sectionals or between chairs with a freestanding unit or on top of a surface. 
Um, I think I have three or four questions that all kind of hover around the uh, the question of sanitizing the furniture uh, uh, post event or pre event, both the in particular things that like upholstery that can't typically be just simply wiped down? What, is, what are course protocols um, going forward? That's a great question. So our operations team have been spending innumerable hours uh, you know, testing different uh, cleaning methods and sanitation methods. And uh, they, they have identified some ways that they can sanitize um, fabrics and, and and not just the vinyls and the PUs. Um, we have uh, some established protocols and guidelines now for uh, cleaning and sanitizing and disinfecting, disinfecting uh, fabrics and the vinyls. And uh, coincidentally, Court uses uh, a brand of vinyl that uh, is a hospitality grade that is can be used with a bleach solution. So um, you know our furniture, <coughs> we we clean it after every as soon as it comes back from an event it, you know it may sit for a day or two but then it would get completely cleaned and sanitized you know according to these protocols and then wrapped up and it's certified that it is clean and ready to go we call it show ready so if an event comes up we're not you know caught flat-footed we can quickly pull furniture for an event or a trade show and it's wrapped and we know that it is certified sanitized and ready to go. So there okay. are cleaners out there that we have identified for fabrics as well as, you know, just bleach solutions for vinyls. All right. So what past trends from 2019 or 2018 are definitely out for 2020 and 2021? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, not, not a lot of trends have really gone out. And I think that's because hear my barking dog. Um, I think that's because of the eclectic nature of design right now. Um, offhand, I'm trying to think of something that would be really out right now. Um, really have to think about that. Just because we're seeing in design, you know, the 70s and the 80s are out there as well. Uh, plus all of these design trends that I just spoke of. Um, honestly, I would have to think. I cannot think of a trend that's really, really out. I would love to say white, but but in the furniture market, if you go to a furniture market, you don't see white anywhere. It's nowhere in the design trends. Um, it, you do see a lot of those light oatmeal textured fabrics. However, we know in our industry that white is the strongest uh, rental color for us and I think for most of all uh, event designers and our customers like white because it's a clean palette and it pairs easily with a brand's design or brand colors and and so you know that's that's the one thing I can tell you is that white from a design perspective is out but for our industry it's not out all right so I think one final question and I'm going to put a little bit of a plug in for classic exhibits um, after I ask the question, does Cord have any kind of brandable no-touch hand sanitizer station? And to the that questioner, I'll say Classic does, and they're all made in the <laughs> U.S. And we have developed quite a few over the last month, and it may be something that Court might want to consider. So that's my that's my short plug. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, and we are. We don't currently right now, so but uh, uh, we are considering um, and thinking about development of those types of rentals as well. You know, certainly this is a, a fast-moving, changing time, and so you know we're all, I think, thinking about how we're going to design that next level of ex events and exhibits um, that make our customers feel safe, that make them uh, want to go to trade shows and events again. And I think, you know, thinking about, you know, some of these things and incorporating them into design and having these, you know, uh, sanitation procedures and guidelines, I think will help. But, you know, like I said at the beginning, I think this is a very dynamic and fluid situation. And, you know, maybe some of the things that I presented today won't happen or won't be as important and other things will be more important. So, but I think you know, having these discussions, having these conversations, you know, I've been, you know, attending and 
seeing a lot of webinars and white papers. And I think we're all just going to have to continue to do that as things change. So, you know, we can share ideas and because, you know, even though maybe some of us are competitors and, and, you know, we're all in the same industry and we're trying to bring this industry back and do it in a way so those uh, people will, you know, travel again and they will come to events, trade shows and, and, and conferences. Thanks, Kevin. That was the last question. Do you want to wrap up? Yeah, I think I, I just said it. I really appreciate uh, everybody in attendance, and uh, you know, my email is out there, and I'm certainly open for uh, questions post event. And I will reiterate uh, what I said about the deck. Um, if you email me, um, if you don't know who your court representative is, I will get you in touch with them, and they can provide the deck to you. All right. And on behalf of Classic Exhibits, uh, thanks to everyone. We will send out um, the recording of this presentation in the next couple of days. And if you have any questions, um, please contact me at mel at classicgibbets.com. Have a great day. Stay safe. And more importantly, stay sane. Thanks. Thanks again, Mel. Bye-bye.